Hi everyone, my name is Florent Farge and in this video I finally get to talk about a subject that a lot of people want to hear about, talking about glazing. In the history of art, glazing is a very important technique. It appeared soon after the introduction of oil painting and for the first time in art, the artists were able to play with transparency and take advantage of all its visual possibilities. Somehow, I think that it was overused at a time in the history of art and it became sort of old-fashioned after a while. So today we could say that glazing is sort of old school, but it doesn't mean that we should not take a look at this and see if we can make something beautiful out of it. So what are we talking about first of all? Glazing is applying a transparent or semi-transparent layer of paint over another thoroughly dried layer of paint. The dried layer is then called underpainting or first painting, and the glazes can stack up for many layers, creating the second, third, fourth painting and so on. Due to the effect of transparency, glazing has a visual depth that is almost impossible to obtain otherwise. It also seems that the objects made by glazing are a little bit more eye-catching. You have to keep that in mind because you don't want to let it go out of control. So where does this impression of depth come from? Well, the effect is comparable to what happens when you use glossy varnish on your painting. It is due to the reflective properties of the surface. So let's look at an opaque painted surface with a matte finish. As you can see here, when the light hits the surface, it is scattered or diffused in every direction. And because of that, the image appears slightly hazy. The visual information received by the viewer's eye is all over the place, so the colors don't look very intense. It is especially visible for the darkest colors. The only advantage of a matte surface is to reduce glare, but at the cost of color intensity. Now let's take a look at the same surface coated with a glossy layer of oil. Because the top layer is transparent, when the light hits the surface, it splits into a part that is refracted through the transparent medium and another part that is reflected, creating a specular reflection. This is where the annoying glare that oil painters often struggle with comes from. The rest of the light continues its path through the transparent medium and hits the pigment. Because of the nature of the transparent coating surface, the reflected light is much more directional than in the first example. The light doesn't scatter as much and the information received by the viewer's eye is much more descriptive. This is why a glossy surface creates more intense colors, and this is crucially true with the darkest colors. Of course, you have to be aware that these two examples are not entirely correct, because a painting is a complex object that exhibits both types of reflections at the same time. Anyway, what matters is that you understand that glossy surfaces create more intense color impression. Now, in the case of a glaze, you have to create a layer with very little pigments in a transparent medium, creating the same kind of glossy surface. This is why glazing is known for being able to create deep and intense colors when used well. In some way, it is comparable to spreading a transparent layer of oil or varnish on a painting, but with the addition of transparent pigments that let the light go through. In the end, you have both the effect of color intensity plus the benefits of optical color mixing. And let's talk about that. Although it has the advantage of being able to create pretty unique colors, the downside of glazing is that the colors that result from it can never be predicted with great accuracy. Why is it so hard? In the case of a physical color mixing, the biggest part of the light bounces around the medium and gets out as the resulting mixed color. 
at the same time, another part of the color impression is also the effect of our brain interpreting blue and yellow pigments next to each other as green, just as in pointeism. So as you can see, physical mixing of colors is already pretty complex. But the easy thing is that you get what you see. You just try this on your palette and you know that this is what you will see on your painting. Pretty simple. In the case of a glaze, colors mix just like if someone placed a colored filter on top of an object from another color. The light goes through the layers, resulting in a mix of the two. But it is not easy to predict the exact color that you might get in the end, because every pigment can react differently to the light or be more or less transparent. In fact, because no paint can be perfectly transparent, you will most of the time get a side effect of glazing. Some of the light will scatter on the top layer and not go through both layers. It will bounce back to your eye and your brain will still only see the green but feel the strong blue element of the mix at the same time. This is important because it means that most of the time blue glazed over yellow will not feel the same as yellow glazed over blue. This is the promise of infinite color mixing possibilities but at the same time it can be pretty confusing if you don't have the right strategies. The material needed for glazing is pretty simple. A few hot bristle brushes and sables should be enough. You want to brush with good bristle retention because it's very important that you control the quantity of pigment that you apply. Glazing is not about applying a big quantity of oil, but rather about laying down a small quantity of pigments. With glazing, it is crucial to keep things under control, so it's probably best to get good quality natural brushes. There is no special medium dedicated to glazing. I suggest you use the same medium you use for the rest of your painting. And don't go buy expensive special glazing medium, as they're not any better than any medium you can make yourself. I think that many people focus way too much on the magic of the medium, so to say, uh, especially for glazing. People often talk about old masters of the Renaissance who would use some secret medium recipe for glazing. Uh, maybe but they were not successful thanks to their medium, but rather thanks to the ways they used it. As long as your medium is transparent, you can use it for glazing. And regarding medium, keep in mind that you should follow the fat over lean rule and that your glaze layer is just like any other layer of paint. I think that the most important thing to remember is that you don't have to drown your pigments in medium. In fact, very little medium is needed. Glazing is just about applying a small quantity of pigments on the canvas. The medium just gives a better flow, but that's it. Uh, a glaze is not supposed to be super fat, contrary to what some people might think. For glazing you want paint with either transparent or semi-transparent pigments. Refer to the label on your paint tubes. For every opaque pigment that I have, I try to find a similar transparent color. There is a great choice of transparent pigments and lakes to suit every painter's need. Here's a glazing palette to give you an idea. Ultramarine blue, burnt cumin, alizarin crimson or quinacridon or permanent alizarin. Uh, transparent red, transparent burnt umber or transparent brown, and uh, yes, you can glaze with dark transparent colors, it's actually pretty useful. Transparent burnt sienna, yellow lake, sap green, and finally titanium zinc white. About white, you should know that there is no white for glazing because by nature, white negates the transparency of a glaze. Even zinc white, the most transparent of all the whites, is not suited for glazing. As far as pure glazing goes, you should avoid white. Just know that some whites 
are more transparent than others, zinc white being the most transparent, but not very reliable by itself, and titanium white being the most opaque. So, as I said before, the most important thing about glazing is to keep it under control. To help with this, I try to make an essential difference between two types of glazing which have different uses. The first type is what I call chromatic glazing, and the second one is what I call transition glazing. I will try to demonstrate those with this sketch that I made for the purpose of this demonstration. Because glazing is usually something that can be very subtle, it was hard for me to get footage on one of my actual paintings. So I made this little study to make it easier to play around with glazing. Uh, keep in mind that I will deliberately exaggerate things and that normally I would be a lot more careful and subtle. But anyway, this uh, sketch will be great to experiment and see the possibilities of glazing. I've painted this underpainting with uh, a very limited palette of only burnt sienna, burnt umber, ivory black and titanium white. I have let this painting dry and now it's ready to be glazed, so let's start. Let's have a look at the first type of glazing, chromatic glazing. I glaze this fabric with a French ultramarine blue. I start with a hot bristle brush to control the quantity of paint. I roughly scrub the paint to get the desired thickness and transparency first. When this is done, I go over it with a much smoother red sable to make it more even. If you want to make uh, your color more intense, you can still apply more pigment. So as you can see, the key is to control the quantity of pigment. And it was a very popular technique during the Renaissance, when the pigments were very expensive to find and transform. Thanks to glazing, artists were able to paint their first layer using inexpensive paint at first, and then add the expensive colors as a glaze. Furthermore, it was possible for the old masters to create some unique colors that were not yet discovered back then. Don't forget that the great variety of pigments that we know today did not always exist. If you think that it is too intense, you can always take a piece of paper towel and remove some of it. Ok, let's say that this blue is not what you wanted. You can always take it off and start from scratch. You just remove the ultramarine blue and glaze with another color.
to let you see what happens when you glaze with two colors at the same time, I'll now add some yellow lake in the fresh sap green. As you can see, you can still modify the color of a glaze after it's been laid down. Also, it's very important that you don't just lay down your color, but take the time to control the edges and check if your values are still correct. You can't just glaze and consider that you're done. You should always check your values after glazing. And there's a nice trick that I want to show you. If you want to recreate the effect of shadows while glazing, you can use a transparent complementary. Here, the complementary to this yellow green is some sort of magenta, like this burnt carmine. As you can see, when applied over the green, it makes it more gray and also darker. You can use this trick to reinforce the shadows. In my opinion, you should keep this technique for artificial objects as it is not easy to be accurate with it, especially if you want to paint skin tone, for instance. For finer work and features of the human body, there is another type of glazing that I call transition glazing. This technique doesn't use glazing all over the canvas, but just where transitions and edges need to be improved. Using this approach, you don't use glazing as you would with a chromatic glaze. It's a lot less intense in terms of color, and usually it complements the construction of the form pretty well. This is the type of glazing that was made famous by Da Vinci in the Sfumato. To show you that you can't just glaze the same way you do for a chromatic glazing, I'll try to do a chromatic glazing just as I did in the last step. If I glaze over this lips with a full color, for instance, it is way too strong. So what's the solution? How can you control it? Well, you need to have the right strategies. Actually, there are three solutions. The first solution is to mix your transparent glazing color with some opaque neutral color. This will make the glaze a little bit less chromatic and allow you to create more realistic effects. You keep some of the transparency of the glaze, but you also keep the control over your color. My advice if you want to glaze is to always have some opaque colors ready to counteract the effects of glazing. It's good to know how to use a powerful technique, but it's more important to know how to neutralize it if necessary. The second solution is to use some kind of transparent brown for glazing and brush it off with a clean dry brush. Here as you can see, I applied too much color, so I can just spread it off by scrubbing with my clean bristle brush. It's important that this is hot bristle and that it's clean and dry.
The last solution is to use very little paint every time, but to make many glazing layers. A careful examination of the work of artists like Da Vinci or Titian revealed that they could use up to several tens of successive glazes to perfect the blurry effect that they were looking for. This technique is particularly useful to make the forms blend into each other and correct the inaccuracies of the first paint. As an oil painter, you can see glazing in two different ways. You can see glazing as a structural part of your painting, which means that you don't make an unpainting with full colors, but only a monochromatic painting in black and white or grisaille, and rely on glazing to bring colors later on. Without glazing, your painting could not exist. But you can also see glazing just as another tool to add to your repertoire. In that case, you paint the end of painting with a full range of color and use glazing for retouching and refining if necessary. That means that if you get exactly what you want on your first painting, you might just not use glazing at all. Personally, I don't like to rely too much on glazing and in my opinion, it should not be a structural part of my painting. I don't really feel that glazing is necessary in any of my paintings. I just consider that it's another tool to add to my repertoire and I use it only if I need it. You should not rely on glazing to correct the color. If you see something that needs to be changed in your first painting, you should do it right away and not wait for a glazing layer. Glazing has the advantage of preserving the texture of the painting and the brush strokes. But be careful, too much of it can kill the vitality of the brushwork. And finally, the most important, glazing is only as good as your underpainting is. Painting a good underpainting with accurate values is more important than glazing. 
Always remember that a glaze can't correct the mistakes of the end of painting because it doesn't have enough body. Alright, I hope this video was helpful to you. If it was, please consider subscribing and leaving a like. All support is greatly appreciated and really helps me a lot. As always, have fun painting. Bye.